You know, and I don't like them announcers do, but I know they do it sometimes. I get why. When they're like, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, are you ready? I don't. Yeah, I just said so. Yeah, I, okay, we'll do it louder. But, so where were we? Proverbs 30. Yes, Proverbs 30. Both of these are pretty long, so we'll move through 30 kind of fast before we hit 31, which is the last chapter of Proverbs. So this one was a different prophecy, not from Solomon, not from Solomon's people, but still Proverbs nonetheless. It was words of Agur, who was the son of Jake. Let's call it Jake. And he spake it unto Ithiel, and then Ithiel unto Eucal. So this is kind of a linear proverb that went down through it. But he said, Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy. This dude saying, look, I didn't grow up in church or surrounded by the stuff my whole life. I'm, you know, kind of a brute dude. I'm not super duper smart. But here are just some things that I noticed that the evidence of it speaks for themselves. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? I can't tell. So this is dude just talking about the miracles, everything that you see around you, the different stuff that has happened that for sure has happened, but he doesn't know how, and he's not going to pretend to tell you how it happened or why it happened. He doesn't know the name of God nor the name of his son. He just knows that they without doubt do exist from the obvious. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. If you try to lie on God, you probably will be found out eventually. If you say God's going to do this and he doesn't, you've been found out. If you say God said this and people check that he didn't, you're going to be found out. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. And I like this a whole lot. This is kind of... Uh, you know, you read some things and they just stick with you a lot more than others. This one does that, did that to me. I hope it does it for you too. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Don't want to be super rich. I'll probably be dead. Don't want to be super poor. Probably dead, but in another way. A lot less cool way. So, but feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee. And say who is the Lord. Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So you see what he's saying there. He was like, look, I know myself. If I get super rich, I won't have a need for God anymore. I'll just put him off to the side and be like, yeah, yeah, I got drill, but I got money to make and Ferraris to drive and stuff like that. He just knows himself. He said, but don't make me poor because then I'll start stealing things and disobeying your commandments just to stay alive. And I don't want to do that either. So he knows himself. He knows he's not going to be. <clears throat> one of the John the Baptist poor eating locusts and honey out in the wilderness letting being so holy that God's providing for him because I know if I'm poor and hungry I'll probably start stealing honestly he knows himself so he's like please just keep me in the middle keep me humble so I can stay on the right track for God accuse not a servant unto his master lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty don't go around you ever had somebody, has anybody ever been like a boss or a manager? <coughs> Some of us? <clears throat> well, if somebody comes and tells on somebody else, and normally it's not for that big of a deal, that person never gets in trouble, like ever. You just how to, you just made yourself out and be like, oh gosh, I don't want to be around this person. All I do is complain about other people. And so if you do that kind of to God in a sense, like if you're going around complaining, about like, oh, these people, that church does this, this guy did this wrong to me, and they're all Christians. You're kind of looking silly. Like, I was like, okay, we'll handle it. I've given you books and books of instructions on how to handle this kind of stuff. So be careful accusing other people, especially to God. There is a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and is yet is not washed from their filthiness. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. That's not a good thing. I know it reads like a good thing, but that means that they're very prideful and boastful. Uh, this is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives. 
and devour, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. The horse leech. Has anybody ever had a leech on them? Yeah. You had a leech on you? Really? I, I don't think I've ever even seen a leech in the wild. I've seen them in like tanks and stuff. But not once have I ever seen a wild leech. That's pretty crazy. But that was, were, they, were they that big? No. Yeah, I heard they're a lot smaller, like the bottom one, even smaller than that. They fit in your eyeball. Uh -oh, gross. That's what that one is. Uh -huh. Yeah. So apparently there are leeches, and they do try to attack your eyeball. If you're swimming underwater, that's their, that's where they go. That's their go-to point. Anyway, <clears throat> the horse leech had two daughters. Crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not, it is enough. You ever wonder that? Like three things and four or fourth, I will turn away from Amos. You remember that? For three things and for four, I will turn away. Must have been a big thing back in the old times. Because he was like, for three things, but for four, it's too much and it's over. The grave. The grave will never stop accepting people. It might stop burying you. But death, until the end, when death loses, it's not going to stop. He's never been like, okay, enough people have died. So the grave is never fulfilled, like the horse leech or a tick or whatever. The barren womb. So, I don't know, this is more of a woman thing, but I just imagine the, the sheer fact that some people can't have children probably drives them crazy, simply because they can't. There are women who can and simply don't want to or won't. And there are women who try their whole life and can't. So think of like Samuel's mom. That's what it always comes back to. She prayed and prayed for her child. And it was definitely very, very important back then. Probably more so because that was like your lineage. And if you didn't have like, I don't know, a son or a husband or whatever, then some wives or mothers, because you know back then they had ten wives, wouldn't get the same treatment as the ones that couldn't. And so... In this case, the barren womb, I guess, just saying it probably would hurt a little bit. So, I'm a guy, I don't really understand that fully, but... And the earth that is not filled with water, the desert, is dry no matter how much it rains or pours on there. Just going to suck it right up, because it's sand, like the beach. When you think about that, that's cool. That was in a few Proverbs before. The beaches, because they're made of sand, is what makes the ocean not be able to pass them. So when you think about that, like how does that really work? So when new volcanoes are formed in islands, it's a long time before they start getting sand there, and there's a lot of erosion because of it, and it keeps growing and getting wild. If you've ever been to Hawaii, you see it. So I was like, huh, that is right. How do they get the sand there? I'm not talking about Myrtle Beach or a lot of those places, because that sand's imported, but even under it, there's still sand. It's just not as pretty and a lot more rocky. But it'll just swallow up the water. And fire fire doesn't stop you can keep as long as you keep putting wood on it or giving it something to burn it'll keep burning it will not go out it'll never be satisfied so the eye that mocketh that his father and despises to obey his mother the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagle shall eat it some photographer got them both in one picture i'm very thankful for that sometimes pictures are hard to find and this one was really cool there be three things which are too wonderful for me yea four which i know not Again, with the threes and fours. The way of an eagle in the air. So, too wonderful for me. Yea, for which I know not. So, if you look at something flying, and especially back then, no one had ever flown before. So, he would, you see the eagle flying, like, I wonder what it's like to be up there looking down on everything. Or just be able to go right to the top of a mountain without having to walk it. The way of a serpent on a rock. Why is that too wonderful for him? Wonderful doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing. Like, oh, that was so wonderful. Just wonderful. You look at it like, huh. So we all know that they're kind of cold-blooded. They come out on rocks to get warm. But most of the snakes that comes out on rocks, there's a lot of them. And so there's a lot of, like, canyons and places where there's a lot more snakes than there are other ones. So they come out there, and he's not going to go by them. The way of a ship in the midst of a sea... Even still, I, I mean, I get buoyancy and I get all that, but you see some of these huge cargo ships full of, I don't know, a million tons or whatever they get on there, a whole lot, and they just float. I'm like, how in the world does that not just go 
sink right down. And even I even kind of understand it. So I can imagine this dude who claims to be a brute and doesn't know too much seeing a ship's like, dude, that's wild. How it just cuts through waves. And the way of a man with a maid, so this is something he doesn't understand. If you have a maid or a woman under you, you can overstep bounds a lot easier because they are your maid, they work for you, and so if you you know, you got bosses and stuff, that was kind of a big deal for a while. And now you get fired really quickly if you do that. I guess that's a good thing, but there's ways he doesn't understand. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. So as long as there is no evidence, she thinks she is clean. Same for dudes. If I can cover it up, I can hide it from God. That is not the case. We know that is not the case. For three things, the earth is disquieted, and the four which I, it cannot bear. So disquieted just means um, shaking, trembling. Something's causing a ruckus in it. And the four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat for an odious, an odious just means hateful, mean woman, an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her mistress. So why doesn't the earth like those things? Why wouldn't the earth like a servant in charge? A servant when he reigns. Why wouldn't God like it? Why didn't Jesus like it? You remember Jesus? He said, I didn't come to reign, I came to serve, so to speak. And he was telling his apostles, he's like, let who's greatest among you be a servant of all. Because he didn't want to disobey this. So <clears throat> the reason it's important for a servant not to reign is because they have a lot to do and they're better at doing it. Some people get so good at their jobs, they will never get promoted. Why? Because they need to stay right where they are. So sometimes it hurts them, but in this case, it's more of a good thing. And it can also be looked at as, if you are a servant, now you are in power, you were so caught up in knowing how to serve that you don't really make a good ruler. Sometimes bosses have to be mean, or managers have to be a little mean to get the point across, but it, and I know this is going to sound bad for saying it, but it's for a greater good that they don't understand. Oh, I hate that so bad, but it's true in a little bit of cases. But that can be taken way out of context to, you know, force mandates on people. It's the same argument they use, but not using it for that case right here. So what about a hateful woman? Why doesn't God like that? Anybody? No? Oh, I don't think so. All right, <laughs> and a handmaid that's heir to her mistress. If you're a servant to somebody, but if they die, you get it. You get their position. You're not really going to be that good of a servant, right? Because you've so like if I'm up for a promotion in like the military or a job, and all that dude has to do is mess up to get fired, and then I get his position, then I'm if he tells me to do something, I'm not going to do it that good. I'm not, half mess it up, why not? Because if it messes up, he gets the blame for it, he gets fired, and I get put in charge. I wouldn't do that, of course, but that's what it's saying here. That's why you're on rocky ground. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. So in the summer, while everybody else is relaxing, they're getting ready for winter. Winter comes, they're preparing for summer. They're always preparing for what's next, and therefore, they're going to be here even after nuclear, everything. There's answer one of the things predicted to just always be here. The conies, these little guys, are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in rocks. Why would it be smart to make your houses in rocks if you're one of these little guys? Because you can fit in places where big, scary animals that want to eat you can't, and it's rocks. They listened to Jesus. They built their house on a rock. Jesus wasn't around yet, but they were smart enough to do that. Yeah. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth of all of them by bands. They don't have a leader. They don't have king locusts flying around. But if one goes one way, they all go that way. They attack in swarms. They stay as a swarm, as a whole. Why? Because they know there's power in numbers. And they can go and eat and eat and devour different places. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Is this your favorite one? Your favorite animal? Yeah. 
So it works with its hands, it stays, it hunts, and it kills different things. And it's sneaky a little bit. Spiders aren't, some are kind of dumb, they'll just run across you, but they kind of keep to themselves, so to speak. In the insect terms, mosquitoes don't. They come and try to bite you, and other animals don't. But spiders, just, you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone for the most part. And they kill other bugs. I don't mind seeing spiders there. But because of that, they will be in king's palaces. You can't get rid of spiders no matter where you are 100%. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely and going. A lion which is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any, because he's the strongest. A greyhound and a he-goat also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. So if a king doesn't have any enemies or anything to ever worry about, no one's going to backstab him. It's pretty bad because then he just do whatever he wants. Hopefully he's a good king and then he doesn't have anything to worry about and he'll enter a golden age as some kings have. Or he's just going to be a bad king because he has nothing to worry about and he can do whatever he wants. That can go both ways. What it's saying here is just the people who have nothing to worry about or little to worry about. All right. Proverbs 31. Is everybody ready? The last one. Let's go. It's kind of quick. It's almost like this isn't from Ahur. This is from a new, completely different person also. And it's almost like Proverbs felt bad about just bashing chicks for so long, for so many Proverbs. Like, well, let's throw them a, a bonus chapter at the end here. <laughs> so, ladies, this is a chapter to you. Enjoy. Let's get into this. The words of a king of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So I'm a dude, I'm about to be king, and my mom comes up to me and she's like, Listen, you're gonna be king soon, you're gonna need a queen. This is the type of woman you should look for. How many of our mothers sat us down and told us what type of woman we should look for to marry? Well, mine sure didn't. So she probably should have had Proverbs and stuff like that. So I've had advice from a lot of people, but so she's just getting him ready, like, look, women, you're about to be a king. This can mess you up, so I'm going to be a mom and try to help you. Um, what, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? So first off, this is a prophecy. How is it a prophecy when it's just a mom giving advice to her son, a king? Why do they call it a prophecy? Well... We know the second Peter, when he was talking here, he says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So this was considered prophecy because it just goes down through all kings and to all sons. Just words of wisdom to live by. So also a proverb, but something that can come true or will come true. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why it came through. So they took this and said, this is the Holy Ghost talking through her to help him. That's how good of a proverb this is. And you hear this a lot all the time, but I like Mr. Vody Balkum's quote here. The Lord told me is no substitute for the Bible says. Amen. So you hear prophecy. Well, why does God tell me this? I don't know. It's not in the Bible. So it's probably not God. Easy enough. Mm. Right. So what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women. Nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So give not thy strength unto women. And uh, this week, I don't know if you know this or not, but Harris, Kamala Harris briefly takes over as Biden undergoes anesthesia for colonoscopy day before 79th birthday. The first time ever a woman held presidential power in America unbiblical to this right here. He gave his strength unto a woman. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's funny. It's the first thing I thought of when I read that. I was like, hey, didn't Biden just do that? I was going to make Sean jokes, but then the Bible trumped it. So, And then, nor thy ways which destroy the kings, which is what? What destroys kings more than anything? Greed. Thirst for power. Because how do they always like to get more power? By sending people to die for it. Not themselves, but others. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Don't get drunk. You'll make stupid decisions, son. Please don't do that. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. 
So if you're very drunk, sometimes you and your friend might get drunk, like, um, and then your friend does something stupid, but because he's your friend, you're like, ah, we were just drunk, let us go, okay, and you get a second chance. But if you weren't drunk, you probably wouldn't have gotten that. It just, it gets you on rocky grounds. You can let some things go that you wouldn't before. So she's saying just don't drink. Just don't be a drunker because you'll make silly decisions. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. This, this is biblical prophecy telling them when it's okay to drink. And who can drink and who can't. This is very interesting. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. So you can say, well, you shouldn't, if they're about to die, you should pray for them and get them all spiritual and stuff like that and make sure that they're ready to die. And you might disagree with this, that you shouldn't give strong drink unto people that are ready to die. But you ain't saying nothing about morphine, and that's way more than alcohol, so yeah. check yourself, homies. <laughs> so I, you get this, and this comes from like if you're on a battlefield and you're stabbed and you know you're going to die, like, there's no hope. We'll get you some alcohol because we didn't have the medicine and stuff back then. And like myrrh, they used to mingle it with myrrh and give it to people who were about to die. And hyssop, whatever that stuff was. And because it helps you, it helps ease the burden of death for you a little bit. Why wouldn't you do that? And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. So if you got a broken heart or if that was your friend that just died beside him and had to give him a strong drink, give that person wine to help kind of take the edge off of it, help him stop from crying or suffering. Let him drink and forget his poverty, so poor people, and remember his misery no more. So I know poor people ask for money and just get drunk all the time. I'm not saying give them the money to buy alcohol for that. But if you see them drinking, who else deserves drinks more than people who have literally nothing going for them in life? That's why I do before said, please don't make me poor or I'll start stealing and drinking all the time. And I don't want to do that because disobeying God. So three things. And this happened to me in basic training. I was this one guy was like, the Bible says it's never okay to drink ever. Not even in communion, you should use grape juice. I was like, <laughs> I was just 19 year old me, but I've been to church my whole life. I was like, you think Jesus drank grape juice? And when it says wine all the time, he's talking about, yeah. he was like, yeah, it had to have been. Jesus wouldn't have drank. And I was like, all right, what about this? Because I remember reading this too a long time ago. Because I would have said, give him strong drink unto him that's ready to perish and wine to the heavy heart. And then let him drink and forget his poverty for a poor. And he goes, he gave the, the, I forgot what kind of church he went to, but the answer, he said, that just means of the spirit. I was like, okay, so give him strong drink of the spirit and wine of the spirit and let him drink of the spirit if he is poverty. I was like, no, dude, that's explaining alcohol. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> you are wrong on that one. <coughs> Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. She's telling them, be a good king. Stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. Fight for people who are too weak to fight for themselves. Fight for a righteous cause. Fight for the poor people. You know, like we want all our leaders to be and what all their campaigns try to run on up, off of, even though none of them ever really come through and fulfill what they say they're going to do. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So now we're getting into the woman part. She's like, listen, you're about to be king. This is what you need to look for in a wife. A good wife is way more valuable than rubies, far above rubies and riches. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships, she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So let's start at the top. Why would she seek wool and flax? What was that used for back then? Clothes. 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 Garments. Rugs. Everything. You get the flax, you mix it in with the wool, makes it stronger, makes it better. Just kind of a seed. So it's saying she works. She actually does things. She makes crafts. She brings her food from afar, meaning she's not dependent on you to feed her, even though it's your job as you know, a husband. She riseth also while it is yet night, meaning very early, and giveth meat to her household. So she has breakfast and meat ready for her house, not just like her husband and kids, but like the household, and even a portion to her maidens, the people who are going to be helping her all day work. 
She considered the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. So she didn't just buy some place because she thought it looked pretty. She bought it because she's like, hey, we can use this. It's going to help us build our house. She girded her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. What would that mean? Her candle goeth not out by night. She stays up all night. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. She stays up working at night, or there's not times when she turns off her being a good wife for different things. She just keeps it going, keeps it going on. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. So a distaff is just those like broom sticky looking things with all of it on there. They'll hold it up back here, and then they'll pull from that into the spindle. <clears throat> I'm not a master of how those work, but I looked it up, and that's how they do it. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So she's also very kind, generous, she gives to people. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. You can look and look to find the meaning for scarlet in this. There's a bunch of different opinions. I think scarlet was just a little bit more of an expensive clothing, a little bit more of an expensive dye. Not much, just showing that she's ready. So not only is she afraid of the snow, and not only is she prepared, but she's well prepared, is what I'm looking for that. Like, not only are we going to be clothed through the winter, we're going to be clothed in scarlet through the winter. So we're, we're definitely ready for it when it comes. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her, house, her husband is known in the gates, and he sitteth among the elders of the land. Meaning, not only is she a good woman, but her husband will be known a little bit more for her. Like, oh, there's Ted. Ted's wife is really cool. She goes around helping everybody. She does this. She does that. They won't have anything bad to say about her to her husband or her husband because of her. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in the time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So she's smart. She knows things. She's nice. She can give you advice that you can't get. Sometimes girls give pretty good advice and like emotions and different things like that, you know. I'm not gonna ask them about war council stuff, but there's a lot of things where I'm like, ah, I don't know, punch him. Like, how about we don't punch him? Let's do this and say like, oh yeah, that would probably work better. So she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. She's not just sitting around doing nothing. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. There's a lot of girls out there, a lot of fish in the sea, son, but you need to find the one that's the best fish that sparkles out of all of them, that shines the most. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, that what? Feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is the, like just the big summary of all of it. Favor is deceitful. Popular. But I want to date the popular chick. Cause she's popular. But it's deceitful. Sometimes that popularity means all eyes are on you and every little bad thing you do gets blown up, right? Popular is a two-edged sword. And beauty is vain. Why is beauty vain? Because it doesn't last forever, does it? And after you've had your taste of beauty for a little bit, and there's nothing else to follow it, beauty doesn't really mean that much anymore. You got a nice pretty rock as a girlfriend. Hope you like it. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And give her the fruit of her hands. So back then, you know, I'm the husband and the wife worked and got all this. She should have all that she just worked for. I shouldn't just hoard it up for myself. And let her own works praise her in the gates. She doesn't have to be known as your husband or your wife because you're her husband. That's what gets her all of her popularity and fame. But let her own works praise her. Let her be kind of her own person and get her own. Like Ted's cool and Sally's cool or whatever her name would be. Not just Ted's cool and Sally's cool because she's Ted's wife. So to speak, get your own popularity. Don't depend on your husband's is what it's saying. 
So there's a funny little saying that's going around, and I've been waiting to use it till we got here. But you remember back in Joshua, tent stake lady? When it says, if you can't handle me at my Judges 4 through 5, then you don't deserve me at my Proverbs 31. I thought that was funny. For those of you who get it. So, uh, yeah, but in order to, you know, overlook Judges 4 through 5, you should be Proverbs 31 first. Let's not forget that. So anyway, that is Proverbs 31, and therefore that is Proverbs. So we'll let him go ahead and kill the feed, and we'll go to...